Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining our conversation today. We're uh, talking about leveraging crypto for cross-border payments in LATAM. My name is Reed Cataldo. I'm a founding partner at Prism Group. Prism Group is an economic consulting firm specialized in blockchain technology with expertise in areas including incentive design, market structure, token economics, consortium governance, and consensus governance. I'm joined today by Craig DeWitt. Craig is a senior director of product at Ripple, where he leads strategic direction and development of Ripple's blockchain network known as RippleNet. We'll be talking about that today. He has been with Ripple since 2015 and prior to that he worked at Adobe and Bloomberg. He has an MBA um, from Stanford's Graduate School of Business and we also have Santiago Alvarado. Santiago is Director of Cross-Border Payments at Bitso. Uh, he's new to the team over there so we're very welcome, uh, lucky to have him today. Uh, where he works on product and business development. Santiago has worked in the fintech industry for quite some time, and he also holds an MBA from Harvard Business School. Welcome to you both. Uh, Craig, I'd like to start with you. Can you give us an overview, kind of set the stage for today, a brief overview uh, for our audience on what is Ripple, what is RippleNet, uh, XRP, and on-demand liquidity, ODL? Absolutely. Um, so I think the good place to start with what is Ripple is really understand the problem that we're tackling. And the problem that we're tackling today is cross-border payments. Cross-border payments um, as an industry moves trillions of dollars um, a, a year. It's really incredible the amount of size that this industry is in terms of the amount of money that's being moved, but it just has not kept up pace with the experiences that we expect um, from the internet. And the problem that we're really tackling is that moving money, no matter how big or how small, is slow and expensive and opaque today. Kind of like the fax machine not catching up the email yet. So what Ripple is doing is we're building a network of financial institutions who can move money instantaneously and at a very low cost. And the, the core tool, the foundational tool that we use to do that is a digital asset called XRP, which is really that medium of exchange that allows those instantaneous cross-border payments with a bunch of technology built on top of it that I'm really excited to talk to you about today. Great. Thank you, Craig. We'll be talking a little bit about infrastructure later in the conversation. Um, no, no better way to get started uh, with Santiago. Santiago, for our viewers, can you give an overview of what, what BITSO is? What is its pi primary function in the industry? And then for context of our conversation, how does it work with Ripple? Uh, sure. So, so BITSO is the, the leading crypto exchange in, in LATAM. Uh, we have been in operation for, for over six years now. And we are happy to announce that we that last week we hit our 1 million user mark. Um, so most of our current volume is in Mexico, but we, we launched in Argentina in, in February and have become the, the largest uh, crypto exchange there. Um, and we hope to open Brazil soon as well. Um, so we, we see Bitso bridging the gap between the traditional financial system and the crypto realm. Um, so we are focusing on building powerful liquidity uh, against local currencies and connecting to the local rails as well in multiple geographies across, across Latin. Um, what I think that's special about Bitso is that unlike most exchanges that focus exclusively on trading, we are actually very interested in building use cases on top of this technology. Um, and of course, uh, cross-border payments is one of the obvious ones. Absolutely, thank you both. Um, so thank you for those overviews. As I mentioned before, we're here to discuss the benefits of crypto for remittance in LATAM. So again, the relationship between Ripple and Bitso is particularly interesting. I think we spoke the other day in our prep call um, that this is something that's live, it's real, it's being used right now. So um, I think in definitely in the crypto blockchain industry, um, that's that's refreshing for people to see that there is some some utility that's going on right now, um, and especially uh, this this part partnership is interesting as, um, to the best of my knowledge, the the U.S. Uh, uh, Mexico mark, uh, is the largest re uh, remittance market in in the world. So, um, Craig, can you give the audience an overview on? Let's talk about the incumbent process um, that we're trying to, I guess, revolutionize of cross border payments. How is RippleNet? Uh, different? What is the approach? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the end user experience. Absolutely. So the incumbent process, when you really, um, when you really dive into it, and you study it, it's really incredible because the foundational aspects of that 
haven't really changed since the time of the Medici's. And that uses a system of what are called Nostrovostro accounts, which are just banker speak for having accounts, essentially checking accounts around the world that are funded with quite literally trillions of dollars in aggregate. Um, today, that number is about $10 trillion locked up in these accounts that are just sitting there waiting to be used. So if you're a U.S. firm and you want to be able to send payments into Mexico, today that requires you to either use an intermediary or hold pesos in advance in Mexico, which causes a whole lot of problems, not just from locking up capital, but from managing that risk. The magic of digital assets and the magic of on-demand liquidity, which is a way of um, making instantaneous cross-border payments, is that you no longer have to have those accounts. Using a digital asset um, from the U.S., you can send funds, that is, you can do an XRP send into a great exchange like Bitso, where funds are then converted instantaneously into Mexican peso and then available to be paid out. And that's why we're really excited with the partnership and really that infrastructure piece uh, that Bitso provides. Because in just a short amount of time, you mentioned the largest, the largest um, uh, cross-border market from U.S. to Mexico. In a short amount of time, Ripple's been able to um, capture about 7.5% of that market just a couple weeks ago. Um, and that's a lot of just individual stories when you look at the remittances. Now people have more money in their pockets because it's cheaper and it's a better experience. So people send more, more money more often. Um, and that, you know, in terms of blockchain, having a real impact on end users' lives. Great. Craig, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another question. I think this is an important for the distinction of, for the audience. Um, there might be two different segments um, of users. There might be uh, maybe a company per se. We talked about balance sheet. We talked about the Nostro, uh, those accounts holding trillions of dollars um, held up that, they're, that they can't use. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't know, holding inventory or, 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 or paying their bills or these sorts of things. But then there's also the individual, uh, maybe peer-to-peer uh, sending money home, for example. Um, what, what, what is top of mind for Ripple? Who are you guys targeting? Uh, where are you seeing the uptake, uh, uptake? And um, what sort of changes might you need to make in order to um, attract that other segment as well? Yeah, very perceptive, Reed. Um, we're, building, we're building a networks business. And when you build a networks business, um, there are usually different participants in that multi-sided marketplace. Um, the people that we sell our software to are the institutions that are actually moving money on a cross-border basis. These institutions are important because they offer the infrastructure and the governance and the legal requirements um, that need to be in place before you move money on a cross-border basis. To them, um, the demands are, how can you create a more efficient system with a better experience that they can then deliver to the end user, that is the retail folks who are actually trying to send money home. So what RippleNet provides them is a standardized API that, is, that gives them a better way of sending liquidity through ODL and the use of XRP that ultimately res results in lower costs and a better customer experience through higher transparency and access. Now, what that does to them is that allows these customers to drive top line revenue by reselling this to the end individuals. So the actual retail customers that you're talking about. And what we've seen with players that, especially in this market, who are moving towards digital, they're able to offer just a 10x better experience on the remittance payments than anyone else. And that is shown by their uptake in the amount of customers who are now using their, their processes to send money on a cross-border basis. So we serve the end customer, mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever making those re retail remittance payments by providing a better experience to our direct market participants, which are the licensed institutions. Great. And Santiago, how would you like to add to that? Uh, yeah, so I think that, that um, just to, to add to, uh, to what Craig said, I think that RIP and Bitso um, really adds value here uh, because of the success of the exchange, right? So uh, we have managed to achieve uh, certain volumes or liquidity that allow um, very competitive FX rates at scale. Uh, against the local currencies. So whenever a transaction um, uh, is sent in XRP, we can immediately convert it to Mexican pesos. And because we have uh, seamless integrations into the local banking system, those uh, financial institutions or the senders can decide if they want to either send those funds to an account or a bank account um, under their own name or do the actual disbursements to the end beneficiary, right? And this whole process 
happens in, in basically real time, which is like uh, one of the biggest benefits, right? It reduces uh, or it frees tied up capital in, in, in Nostra accounts, as, as Craig mentioned, and reduces the, the FX volatility risk. And so Santiago, you guys are very active. You're the largest player in, in the Mexican market. Um, as you look to expand, what sort of characteristics in the other countries uh, within LATAM um, draw you to opening up uh, and, 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 tar- and, and aggressively targeting uh, your next country and the one after that? Uh, sure. So specifically talking about Argentina, which was the second market we opened, um, Argentina has a, a very uh, large crypto community um, and as well uh, a huge um, like freelance user base. So there's a, a, a very interesting, interesting dynamic in terms of cross-border payments where, uh, for instance, freelancers or, or engineering contractors in Argentina provide services to companies in the U.S. Uh, and we can provide a, a, certainly an alternative for, for them to receive those payments in a, in a much more efficient and, and uh, at lower costs, right? Um, another important factor is regulation, certainly, and uh, establishing relationship with, uh, or solid relationships with uh, local banking partners. Um, and then, of course, there's sheer market size. Uh, so that's why we, we intend to, to market Brazil, uh, to target Brazil next. Excellent. Um, Craig, can you explain uh, to us how has the value to the end user increased um, with a partner, for example, like, like Bitso? Um, and then how can it increase further? Let's look a little bit about at infrastructure. Um, where were you guys two years ago? Where are you now? And where, where do you think you might be two years from today? Absolutely. So, so starting with the, with the value of the partnerships, like the partnership with Bitso, um, it's absolutely critical to the end experience that Ripple is able to deliver to institutions and their end users around the world. So you know, when, when you think about what Ripple's vision is, is really driving an internet of value, kind of picking apart what that internet means is Ripple is really a network of networks of connecting financial institutional networks with each other. And the type of network that Bitso has created that Santiago talked about of awesome connectivity into local markets like Mexico, that's crucial. And that's something that we want to be able to tap into using both our standardized APIs and this um, excellent digital asset called XRP as that medium of exchange. So the, the end experience that, that Bitso provides and any of our providers is key because they're what gets the hand. There's, they're the ones that get the money into the end institute in the end uh, user's hands. And that varies on a per market basis. So in some markets, that can be very bank to bank heavy. So in terms of delivering funds into your bank accounts. And in some markets, you know, Mexico, Philippines, cash and actually having cash payouts is kind of a crucial piece. So one thing that Ripple spends a lot of time doing is when we find those partnerships, making sure that they have awesome user experiences and they can satisfy the needs of the local, uh, the local population. Now, in terms of where we were two years ago, it's really amazing to think back that ODL, the, this, this payment mechanism I'm talking about, ODL was really re- released in kind of the end of 2018. And it, um, it's, sh- it, it's somewhat shocking to me, even though I've seen the, the rise of this, somewhat shocking that you can go from zero to having a sizable market percentage of one of the largest corridors in the world in such a short amount of time. That usually does not happen in, in, in kind of payments. Um, what you're going to see, though, is Ripple continuing to build excellent experiences like the one into Mexico, like what we have into Europe, like what we have in the Philippines, into the markets where our customers want to send funds. And as we grow out that infrastructure, as we work with partners like Bitso, like others, um, you're going to see a widening footprint in more and more marketplaces where we're able to offer better experiences that are instantaneously, that are instantaneous and cheap. Yeah, the, the number we referenced before of market capture of 7% is absolutely incredible in such a short amount of time. So, um, Santiago, we're looking at you towards, I guess, the last mile, the end user. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, you got, you've mentioned some things already. Um, what's important for you guys? What are you, what are you looking to, how are you looking to improve the offer to the end user? Yeah, so, so first, I guess the, the most important thing is... Um, it, how do we ensure that we can scale the value proposition, right? And by, by value proposition, I mean uh, maintain competitive prices. 
And I think that we need to continue to build the liquidity in the local markets, as well as build bi-directional flows. So, so flows, for instance, um, from Mexico to the US, right? Um, and then there's also a very interesting uh, like virtuous cycle that, that occurs where um, liquidity begets liquidity. Um, so cross-border payments um, benefit from the liquidity in the, in the, at the exchange level and traders benefit from the volume input from cross-border payments. So um, I think we need to continue to work in, in scaling or growing the, the liquidity uh, against the local uh, or, or crypto to fiat um, transactions and, and then, um, offer, uh, seamless integrations to, uh, multiple payout options. Uh, so that, that last mile part of the infrastructure is key, right? So as, as Craig mentioned, um, uh, something between like 70 to 80% of the remittance, uh, from the U S to, to Latin America in general are cash to cash. So, um, having, uh, payout options uh, that have a, 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 a granular physical footprint, that's important. So we're going to continue to work that and offer our financial institution clients uh, a more uh, or more variety in terms of, of payout channels so that they can in turn offer that to the, to the end consumer. Santiago, I, I love what you said about uh, liquidity begets liquidity. That is something we say all the time at Ripple. In fact, I thought our CEO, Brad Garlinghouse, probably trademarked that. I hear that so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Craig, you've been with Ripple now uh, since, again, 2015. How has the outlook, um, maybe of the industry or maybe more specifically um, Ripple as a company, the offerings that you guys have, you guys have launched new products and these sorts of things. How has How has your outlook changed on um, on, on the value that you guys are providing and maybe more about uh, the quick uptake that you guys have seen since, uh, for example, launching RippleNet. Um, where, how, how has that changed in the last couple of years? Yeah, well, you know, if I can, if I can look back to 2000, if I can look back to 2015, um, I think it, it, it's really healthy to have kind of a longer term view of how this industry has grown rather than even look at things on a six month to a year basis. And in 2015, I'd say crypto in general, and I think Ripple was in this as well, was really good at standing up and saying, hey, this has the potential to change the world. Um, and I'd say what has changed over the last even 18 months is that um, for cross-border payments and the work that Ripple is doing, it, it is actually changing, changing the world for some people right now. Um, and what we want to do is we want to increase that footprint um, in terms of lives that it's positively affecting. Because it's, it's really nice at, at the business level to throw around um, the market capture that um, that Ripple is able to do with Bitso in Mexico. The way that I think about it, though, is when you break down that market capture, each remittance payment into that market, and that's really where our focus is on the remittance payment, that's a story, right? That's somebody getting more money and a better experience than they would have otherwise. That goes to things like buying groceries or, or paying their rent. And I think the big difference and the big change is that we can actually fundamentally change and improve people's lives, and we want to do it on a much bigger scope. And we know how to do that. And it's taken a while to learn how to do that, but we know how to do that. We have a game plan and we're going to roll that out into multiple jurisdictions around the world. And uh, we're going to escalate the speed with which we're able to do that. So, you know, I, I love liquidity. Um, I love liquidity begets liquidity. I think success begets success. And the markets where we're seeing that, we're going to replicate that and, um, and kind of grow that footprint and improve people's lives in multiple jurisdictions, not just Philippines, Euro and Mexico, but all around the world. And so Santiago, you said you guys have just passed, I believe it's, maybe 1 million users. What, what are the challenges of acquiring users? Is it, are there hurdles in education? Are there hur hurdles in technology? Um, access to capital? Uh, how, do you, how do you go from, how did you get the first million? How do you go the next to two and then 10? Yeah, so I, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, and I think that uh, one of the key developments in, in, in the last decade has, have of course been smartphones, right? Uh, and smartphones will basically uh, replace to, to, to a certain degree like the, uh, a bank branch, right? So basically people can access uh, financial services directly from their, from their phone. So for instance, uh, someone uh, in a 
a small town in Mexico, we have to drive or, or commute uh, four hours to get to a, to a bank branch, right? And now they can actually, and now they can actually do uh, most of the, of the, or cover their financial needs directly from, from their phones. So I think that the distribution infrastructure for, for a new wave of financial services has already, uh, is already there. Um, so for instance, in Latin America, like between 50 and 60% um, have of, of the population have bank accounts, but almost 80% have smartphones, right? So I think that's super interesting and that has enabled this, this, this huge um, innovation in terms of delivering uh, financial services to those people. Um, and other than that, I think that given the borderless nature of, of crypto, uh, we can provide a very unique um, um, value-added services, right? So for instance, give our users the ability to save in US dollars instead of the local currency, which has a lot of more volatility. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of very interesting use cases uh, appear organically at, at Bitso. And I think that that enhances our our value proposition beyond um, speculative trading. Um, so yeah, I think that this is just the beginning and there's um, a lot of new things and use cases we can, we can build upon. Yeah, Reed, if, if I could add to what Santiago said, because I think it's, it's, it's very true that the infrastructure is really there right now. Um, and in many cases, smartphones is enabling that. But also when you mentioned Brazil, I think it's incredible that a stat in Brazil, more people own cryptocurrencies than stocks. And you just see this, this foundation, um, this infrastructure that is there that is just waiting to be used to kind of replace some of the, the old stuff that has existed, you know, for the last 70 years. Um, that's really exciting. Absolutely. And, and Craig, so we maybe look at a client, um, maybe one we see in the headlines, uh, for example, MoneyGram, right? Someone that's, that's using this, that partners with you. Um, I think uh, maybe a lesson a, a lot of crypto projects ask is, is how can we get this in adoption? How do you go and communicate the value of, of speed? It's, it's, it's quicker, it's cheaper, it's more transparent. How do you communicate this to maybe an incumbent uh, company that might have access uh, to, to, a, to a large number of clients for you? Um, how, do you how do you sit down and, and, and get their ear and say, hey, let's, this could be better for everybody? Yeah, um, it's actually pretty simple. Um, and the simpler the message, the better. You can go into these customers, which Ripple's able to do, and clearly demonstrate that you can deliver a superior product in terms of speed at a much lower cost. It, it's, a, it's a really, um, in some cases, easy conversation to have, especially now since digital assets have kind of shed some of the early perceptions that they had in 2015, 2016. So we're able to really go in and, and show through, um, through actual data the speed and the cost and the access that we're able to deliver in these markets. And that is incredibly attractive to customers. I think the other thing that's really important is to focus on the use cases where you have the highest relative friction. And for Ripple, that is the individual remittance payments. Mm -hmm. So in today's world, um, there's really a difference between what we call treasury payments and retail remittance payments. Treasury payments are these big, bulky, million-dollar payments that are usually used to fund those Nostro accounts that small payments are then sent out of. And there's an industry around making those payments today and they're made in advance and they have individuals on the telephone saying, did you get the money? Is it there? Um, so there's, there's a less of a relative pain for those than there is for these retail remittance payments where you know, if you're gonna send a $200 payment to somebody really who needs it most on that remittance basis, you can't have a team of folks on the phone seeing where the money is at all times. And for Ripple, if we can laser focus, and that's what we're doing with a lot of discipline, laser focus on that use case, you can sell the speed, cost, and visibility in a way that is just unmatched in today's cross-border payments. And so, Craig, again, uh, I want to ask you, you guys are you, you're laser focused. You've been able to capture, again, 7% of market share in uh, U.S. to Mexico remittance. Um, what is the next market that you guys are looking at? I've heard from Santiago that uh, Bitso is interested in Argentina. We'll make a big push in Brazil. Um, how about from your perspective? Where do you see opportunity? Is it, is it in LATAM um, or is it elsewhere? And what sort of KPI will you hit at and, and then, then decide, yes, we're ready for our next big push in this particular market? Yeah. Well, one of the great things that Ripple has, um, and it's been tough to build because I've, I've been on the front lines, 
is we have an existing network of financial institutions around the world, a very massive um, uh, of, uh, infrastructure that we built, and that is our network. And so in terms of where we're going, all we have to do is really listen to our customers and those customers being the ones that are sending funds around the world. So if you think about the markets where you have large remittance flows today, those are the places where Ripple is really working hard um, to build those excellent experiences out with partnerships, with awesome infrastructure to get funds to the customers in a way that customers want those funds. So if you look at places where we're live today, Philippines and Mexico, those are two remittance um, heavy markets. And I know we're focused on LATAM, but Philippines is another great example where that's a country where the GDP is actually fairly reliant on retail remittance payments. And that's a place where Ripple's having a lot of success um, today. So if you think about the retail remittance corridors around the world, that's really where Ripple is spending a lot of time um, and energy building out those awesome experiences. And the KPI that we have right now is really customer focused with a lot of customer centricity. And we want to be able to, again, deliver a 10x better experience at 10x cost differential. That's the same kind of thing that we're doing in Mexico today. Great. And Santiago, I want to ask, uh, your team is obviously growing. Um, I'm sure they're very happy to have you on the team. Uh, where is Bitso investing um, in terms of resources? Are, they, uh, are, are you guys opening up offices around Latam? Um, someone that might be interested in the project, how can they get involved? Um, are you guys hiring? Or what, what, is the, what is the six to 12 month outlook for Bitso? Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, we're hiring. Uh, you can either send me an email um, uh, or, or go to the website and see uh, our open positions. Um, so the, I guess most of the investment right now is attracting engineering talent. Uh, so approximately like 50% of our employee base are, are engineers and we want to make sure that we can continue to, to grow um, those teams um, and continue to pursue all of the, the projects we have in mind, right? Which include a uh, very uh, intensive pipeline in terms of local integrations to, to local rails, uh, as well as new, new product development. Um, and, and also something that's, uh, that's very interesting to us and just to, uh, to what Greg said about the end use cases, I think that besides uh, migrants and individuals who want to send money abroad, we actually want to target SMEs and help them expand their their market frontiers. Um, and given that we believe that the new, new normal will include uh, more remote work, um, I think that this is a very interesting time for SMEs where they can actually uh, attract uh, talent at a, at a global scale. Um, and we, we ideally want to help them do that. Absolutely. And Craig, I think we have maybe uh, time for just one more question from my end. Um, for someone joining the industry, uh, is there a particular thing that you, you've seen over the last maybe five years or so that, uh, that you're excited about? Um, again, I asked you this question of how your perception has changed uh, over the last five years, but um, what, what, are you, what, what are you excited for in the next couple of years uh, with, with blockchain technology? Utility. That's it. Utility. And I think um, if you're joining this, if you're joining this network, um, if you're trying to get into the space, which I highly suggest, any company that you're working with right now um, or looking at joining, really understand the kind of utility that they can deliver to their end customer. I would not think about it in terms of blockchain. I would think about it in terms of um, the value that's able to be delivered to the end user and whether or not it's real. Because this is an industry that has, um, has existed for a while now. And I think people are rightfully expecting to see things that go beyond just speculative trading in the market. And that's why, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time looking at the industry. I think Ripple really stands out, especially with the work we're doing with Bitso, really stands out as a company that is actually delivering real utility today that is affecting people's lives in a way outside of just speculative trading. Um, and to do a plug similar to what Santiago did, which I liked it, is if that's attractive to you, reach out to us because we are, um, we are so hungry for talent in this space because we're growing so fast. We need people to uh, kind of join, uh, join that journey with us and help us do it. And Craig, where can someone read more about um, whether they're interested in using the product or interested in finding more information about careers? Absolutely. We have an awesome website. Um, Ripple.com is the best place to go. Um, we have a careers page in there where you can see what is uh, loaded. 
um, I'll give my contact information. You can also reach out to me. Um, Twitter's probably the best way to get a hold of me, but um, the, the, the website, there's a lot of ways to get in contact with us there, and then you can reach out directly on that public, uh, public handle. Great. And Santiago, where can someone find more information about Bitso? Um, sure, just go to, to bitso.com. There's a ton of information. Um, or again, reach out to, to any of our current employees. Everyone will be very happy to tell you about us, what we're doing, uh, um, and how, how we can work uh, together. Um, so definitely, just, just reach out. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Craig and Santiago. I, I certainly agree, Craig. Uh, this is all about utility and creating uh, user-driven user demand. So um, thank you guys so much for joining us.